What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, The Martian, also known as John, here to talk about this week's UFC card going down this Saturday night from the UFC Apex, headlined by Sean Brady versus Gilbert Burns in a welterweight five-round main event, along with 11 other fights, 12 in total, going down this Saturday afternoon, 4 p.m. Eastern time is the start time. And we are coming off a week off. We're coming off the last card was the uh, Jared Cannonier versus Kyle Bohio card, which was an okay week of fights. I think it was, I would say, uh, somewhere in between not so good and a decent week of predictions for me. You know, I uh, was right about uh, Ryan Loder, Tabitha Ricci on the main card. Um, also predicted the, the Marion Santos fight well, uh, the GM3 fight well, Borshev fight, I thought, Calvicanti, those all went fine, but was wrong about, um, you know, maybe a stab on Leonardo, uh, Dennis Bazuki fight was very wrong about that one, um, and the Ghost of Distance and the Magni Morales fight, uh, and just, I would say maybe some slight value on Jared Cannonier, but not much, so, um, some some good money lines, um, but some some failed ones as well. So um, nice to have a week off. You know, I mentioned this in a tweet, but some weeks I I miss the UFC when we have no fights. I feel you know maybe a little bit of empty or I have a void of time. Uh, but considering the um, the contender series is well underway, maybe that helped. But really, I didn't miss the UFC last weekend. It was nice to have a weekend off. And this week, not looking so good. It's definitely a C-tier card. You know, we got the pay-per-views A-tier, fight nights with the crowd, B-tier. And the Apex cards is C-tier. And that's a clear C-tier card going down this weekend. So not very exciting. But we're on the verge of the UFC uh, Sphere card going down next week, the omalley Murab fight. Uh, that's going to be really interesting to see how that all plans out um at uh the sphere so i'm interested for that and you know this week as long as it is a c-tier card but it's not it's not god awful i think we've seen worse in recent memory so with that being said let's get into these fights we have 12 fights we're starting things off in a featherweight fight between uh zigamantis ramasaka taking on nathan fletcher odds for this one have fletcher as the favor minus 125 uh ramasaka coming back plus 105 um, so we talked about this fight on the last card. It got scrapped right before the fight. Um, you know, I think there was a rumor that Fletcher had staff. He also had a problem with his leg on tough. Not really clear why the fight got canceled, but it did get canceled uh, right as the, the broadcast was starting last week. And I honestly, I've, I've changed my opinion a little bit on it. Last week, I was kind of leaning towards Dogger Pass with Ramuska, and uh, now I'm kind of leaning with Fletcher. I just think Fletcher has the more coherent MMA game of the two, being a, a grappler who's looking to get the fight to the floor. Uh, Ramuska is, uh, you know, a brawler. He's tough. He was, he was in that great fight on tough where he got rocked and hurt early and ended up coming back with great output cardio aggression in there. I just think the guy's a little bit too wild of a striker, and his defensive grappling is not good. He goes to the guillotine. He fails it. He ends up on his back. And I think Fletcher at minus 125 is the better money line bet of the two here, considering he just has a little bit more reliable of a game than Ramaska. And the odds, though, on his sub line, I think, are terrible. I mean, his money line is minus 125, while his sub line is is plus 175. I, I don't think there's any point in taking the sub when the money line is, you know, only minus 125. So I would say Fletcher or pass in that first fight on the card. We're going to move on to the Premier Division. The only fight in the Premier Division and um, the heaviest fight on the card. There's no light heavyweight or heavyweight fights in this card. And we have Andre Petrosky taking on Dylan Budka. Odds for this one. Petrosky minus 260. Budka plus 220. Some action came in on Budka the past few days. We actually saw Petrosky as a near a 350 favorite at one point a few days ago. And I probably agree with the action on Budka. Um, you know, Petrosky is a 300 favorite. Doesn't really seem ever to be the right move. Um, but I also think this fight isn't too bad for Petrosky, where this fight should be a grappling fight. That's where Petrosky is at his most comfortable. And I don't really see anything from Budka that makes me think that he's going to outposition Petrosky here. I could see it being competitive at times, but if you're fighting Petrosky, I think you want to be a guy who's capable of keeping the fight on the feet and punishing 
Petrosky's horrible striking and horrible cardio as well. And I just think that this fight is more likely to be in Petrosky's realm where it's a grappling fight back and forth. And I think Petrosky will eventually win the fight uh, by decision. But I'm not a super confident one there and never looking forward to an Andre Petrosky fight. And He's all the way down here at the second second fight of the night where he deserves to be. And uh, the next fight is in the f- women's strawweight division. Jacqueline Amarin taking on Vanessa Demopoulos. Odds for this one, Amarin minus 300, Demopoulos plus 250. I sort of think Amarin shouldn't have a ton of trouble here. We know Demopoulos isn't great at stopping takedowns, and she does tend to play guard on her back, lay on her back for long periods, looking for submissions or ground and pound or something. Uh, but Amarin is just levels ahead in terms of jiu-jitsu and should be able to easily avoid any submission attempts and keep top position here. And um, Demopoulos can't really put her on bottom either because Amarin, I think, is more dangerous off her back. You know, McKenna learned that the hard way in, in her last fight. Striking, it should be sloppy and competitive. I actually think Demopoulos should have the edge there, but I just don't see this fight staying on the feet for long periods. So I kind of think it's going to be Amarin hitting takedowns and keeping top position while avoiding Demopoulos's, you know, weak attempts off of her back and Amarin probably winning a decision. However, Demopoulos is just a, a great underdog. She has great luck with the judges and she has won a lot of fights lately as the underdog. Um, she was a pick em versus Oliveira, two to one dog versus Jin Yu Fry. Um, 250 versus Murata, 3 to 1 versus Ducati, all winning those fights. Um, so she's had some good luck with the judges. And I think that, um, you know, just with how inconsistent the judging is here, I, I, I don't think obviously there's any way to, to play Amarine. Um, the, the odds have her by decision as the most likely outcome, but I don't even think that I can get behind that at uh, slight juice. So pass all around there moving on gabriel santos uh, yi ja in the featherweight division santos minus 260 yi ja coming back plus 220 gabriel santos good fighter still looking for his first win in the ufc had some uh tough luck you know he definitely beat uh leroy murphy in that fight got robbed in the scorecards there and then was winning and looking solid versus onama before onama came back and knocked him out in the second round in a in a fun fight there and i just this is just a big step down in competition here the fact he debuted versus murphy um is was wild especially considering how good murphy has looked since then you know, dominating Koulibaly and Barbosa in his first main event. Um, you know, my, my opinion on Murphy has definitely rose a lot in the past year. And that means, you know, the opinion on Santos should as well. So, um, Ija is a, a grappler who has mostly submitted uh, regional Chinese bums in his career. Um, I don't think his wrestling is really good. I don't think his top position is really good. He tends to just hit quick, you know, low percentage subs on a lot of these low tier grapplers. And I just don't think that that's going to get Santos here. I don't trust Yi's uh, striking enough to get him down. And I think that he's going to be at a pretty significant striking disadvantage here. So hard to see how Santos loses this one. Um, I don't think I can get behind. 260 uh obviously for a bet i'm just not interested in laying that juice but i do think that that santos is going to win the fight and i also have a sneaky suspicion this one's going to go under two and a half rounds um not really sure how i i guess santos by ko i would say would be the most likely finish um but you know he's he's tough he's going to continuously push the grappling and I don't know. I I just have a feeling it's going to end under two and a half or inside the distance. Haven't made the bet myself yet, but that's just my my intuition on this one. We're moving on to a Brazilian showdown in the flyweight division where we have Andre Lima taking on Felipe Dos Santos. Uh, So this one have Lima minus 170, Dos Santos plus 145. Fun fight here. Looking forward to this one. Both these guys have had, um, you know, fun, fun debuts in in their careers. Um, And I think, uh, I, I, I think Lima was the side to pick him. I took him at some of the at some of the pick him price minus one thirteen. I'd never envisioned him going all the way down to minus one ninety. We see a little bit of buyback on Dos Santos, but I think when the fight's on the feet, I just think that Lima has a little bit more power behind his strikes. I think F- Felipe's punches just aren't super hard. He doesn't have a lot of power. But both these guys are really skilled strikers, and I think it's going to be some fun striking exchanges when it's on the feet. And I think Dos Santos. Definitely going to be looking to mix in some takedowns here, but um, we have seen Lima taken down and struggle, but I don't think his takedown defense is is god-awful per se. Um, I think he probably will get taken down uh, maybe one, two, three times here. I just don't see Santos doing a ton with it. I really don't. Um, So... 
I think Lima will will win a decision here by just landing the more powerful shots on the feet. I do think this one is pretty likely to go to the cards as the odds indicate minus 200. Um, it might be a little more competitive than minus 170, but I ultimately think that, that Lima is the rightful slight favorite here. And um, I, I, I'm happy with the minus 113, obviously, on Lima because the line has moved our way. So uh, enough about that one. Looking forward to that one, though. That's probably one of the best fights on the card. Uh, I, I like both those guys, and I think they will stick around for a decent bit. And next fight is a featherweight fight squash match here. Isaac Dolgarian taking on Brendan Marot. Odds for this one, minus 3,000 Dolgarian plus 1,300 from Marot. About as big of a favorite as you'll see in the UFC. And for right rightful reasons i mean dolgarian is a monster despite losing that last fight you know i think he probably deserved to um get a draw at worst there i thought the first round was 10-8 i thought he arguably could have won the second round despite it ending really badly and then he was obviously gassed uh extremely badly in, in the third round but uh, i mean dolgarian is just a relentless grappler he has um great takedowns great ground to pound decent submission game as well you know he destroyed francis marshall who we saw fight last week against uh, bazookia and he looked solid there i thought um so i think that win is aging pretty well and i just don't think that brandon Marot is going to have any chance at stopping the takedowns here any chance at at surviving the top game of Dolgarian, and he's probably just going to get you know destroyed on the mat in the first round i'll go with the tko prediction for the first round uh and uh you know that's really the only way you can bet the fight uh, the under one and a half is again about as juice as you'll ever see at minus 325 um, but it's it's probably justified I think Dolgarian is just going to absolutely steamroll him for a first round finish to get back on track unfortunately Span versus OSP is canceled that would have been an amazing fight um, but we're moving on to uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to talk about that one in a, in a month or so I think they reschedule, reschedule that one for the uh, UFC 307 pay-per-view in Utah so we're done the prelims already. Six fights down, six more to go. In the uh, lightweight division, we have Rong Zhu taking on Chris Padilla. Odds for this one have uh, Rong Zhu minus 235, Padilla plus 200. Um, Rong Zhu you know just a great name to make puns you know obviously or you know zoo wrong haha <laughs> ha <laughs> hilarious um anyway um padilla um came into the ufc um, short notice unknown kind of guy was a massive underdog and then just <laughs> easily submitted james lontop in that fight that fight was hilarious and i mean yeah he was literally a plus 350 underdog and how easily he took Lon Top down, took the back, and got the choke in was just comical. About as easy of a win you'll ever see from a plus 350 dog. Um, but yeah, um, tough to get a, a, a solid read on the guy. I don't think there's there's not a massive amount of footage out there. And I don't think he's super comfortable on the feet. I definitely think he's mostly looking to get the fight to the floor. He's fought some decent competition. A lot of guys who have you know made their way in and out of the UFC uh, on his regional uh, circuit. Uh, while Rong Zhu is another one, uh, just kind of a, a regional journeyman can crusher uh, Chinese guy, right? Um, he... Uh, just mostly a steamrolled low-level competition guys who are not real fighters um does have a, a win over the legendary uh shalian Nuridebeka, uh also known as yilin Sha, who's in the ufc um but he had in his first day in the ufc you know lost a, a clear decision to kazula vargas who's a small kind of general uh lightweight guy who i don't really put a whole lot of stock in beat up brandon jenkins and then got dominated by ignacio bahamundes missing weight in back-to-back -back fights um so interesting to see if he can make 155 here he did make a good account of himself on the road to ufc uh, and he's a dangerous striker man he he throws and and lands some some hard strikes on the feet and i did think that he will be the better striker than padilla here by a decent margin should be quicker more powerful and i just don't think padilla has much in terms of defense or reactions and uh padilla is going to need to get the fight to the floor for sure i think that he does have potential to do so because wrong zoo's takedown defense is not good and um, we could see Padilla getting those back takes. I think Zhu Rong does give up the back when he's taken down. So if Padilla is able to hit that takedown, he might be able to sneak in those two hooks and get a, you know either a round winning effort with a, a back take or maybe even get the submission. So considering I think it's a pretty clear striker versus grappler dynamic here, and I think that I trust Padilla to get the fight to the floor, 6-1 to one on his sub line, I do think is a good way to play him. But I also just think his money line here is a little wide. I could not... 
um, get behind laying 70% juice on Zhu Rong versus a guy who is probably going to look to take the fight to the floor. And we know that Zhu Rong um, it just isn't a skilled defensive grappler. We saw that even in his past few fights on Road to the UFC where he has been looking better, still struggling with grappling in those fights. So uh, can't get behind Zhu at all at these prices. And I think Padilla uh, sub especially, but also money line is valuable. We're sticking in the lightweight division and moving on to Trevor Peak versus Yanal Oshmuz in an absolute electric matchup here. Trevor Peak must see TV. Minus 130 for Peak. Oshmuz plus one. 10 doing some tape study on Osh Musa, I mean I I wanted I didn't want to see anything that made me want to bet against Trevor Peak but honestly I think Osh Musa is skilled enough to where him being the dog here is wrong I mean Trevor Peak is a, a largely unskilled fighter who is just tough He's durable, he has cardio, and he's uh, a good athlete, you know, despite being uh, a very unassuming look about the guy. Um, you know, I think his athletic prowess actually takes him a lot longer than his skill, obviously, in, in MMA. Um, so his problem, though, is I think, especially in terms of grappling, he's very susceptible to being taken down and makes a lot of mistakes on the mat and rewatching Oshmoose's fights man I think the guy is an above average grappler and he understands how to set up the takedowns how to you know mix up the takedowns entries control you once you're on the ground he throws a decent amount of ground ground and pound I, I haven't seen him really hunting that many subs but he does throw a good amount of ground and pound and I I just think I got to go with Ashmoos here at plus money. I mean, I just think the skill discrepancy between the guys is uh, big enough to where Ashmoos being the dog is wrong. I know Peak has some size. He sh maybe he's going to have some strength here. Um, but Ashmoos is definitely a, a, a much smaller lightweight than, than average but their height lists them both at 5'9", which is which is a little surprising to me. I think I think Peak should um be a little bigger in there but i mean ashmoos doesn't look like a weak fighter you know the guy has a lot of good muscle definition i definitely believe he's on that good juice as well and um yeah i'm going with the israeli here the controversial pick but we ashmoos also worth noting guys he is a muslim israeli so you know he's not part of uh you know you know, he's not part of the, you know, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm going with Ashmoos at Moneyline at plus money. Um, <laughs> Flyway division next, Matt Schnell, Cody Durden, odds for this one. Schnell is the big dog, plus 265, Durden plus, minus 315. And this is a short notice fight thrown together here. It's supposed to be Matt Schnell versus Alessandro Costa. Cody Durden apparently got a new contract offer. He he said he's flying to Vegas without his corner. He's flying with just his wife, <laughs> which sounds really stupid. But Matt Schnell is such a flawed fighter that I actually think it's not that crazy of a of a you know a, a proposition here um and uh, honestly like coaching they they do most of their work behind the scenes in the gym and i think it's not really that big of a deal that he's not going to have coaches there there's actually a lot of coaches i don't this is kind of a sidebar but there's some coaches in the ufc that won't shut the fuck up like they're, they're fighters and they're fighting and they're yelling at him the entire time like, can you just let the guy fight and, you know, give him advice here and there or give your thoughts here and there? There are coaches that that just love to hear themselves talk and they talk and they shout at the fighters the entire five minutes of the round. It's exhausting. Anyway, speaking of, of those guys, Matt Schnell's coach, Say Sayud, is, is one of those guys. Um, and, you know, so Cody Durden here in the first round, he's going to plow through Schnell. Cody Durden, while he's fresh, significantly better fighter than Matt Schnell in, in, in striking and in grappling. And he should be able to take Schnell down if he wants, but I don't even think he should. I think Cody Durden has enough pop in his punches that he should be able to just put some paws on Schnell. And Schnell's defense is terrible. His chin is terrible. He's been knocked out so many times. And um, <laughs> five losses by knockout. And uh, one in 24, one in 22, um, you know, you have to go back a little further to find the rest of them. But um, as Chris Tanyoni said, I'm not sure what was worse, the knockout punch that, that Schnell absorbed from Urke or Matt Schnell's head bouncing off the fucking canvas after he got knocked out. And even the fight he won against Sumadarji lately, he literally got dropped four times in that fight. So Schnell's chin, his defense are all so bad that 
I just think that plus 265 isn't even good enough to, for me to want to bet him. If you want to bet Schnell, I would bet him by round two, by round three, or live bet him. Because in the first round, I think he's just going to be at a huge um, athletic and skill disadvantage here. And if Durden slows down due to the weight cut, then Schnell might be able to take over. But that's why you take the two, the three, or wait for the live bet because those are all better prices. Um, Schnell could easily just get knocked out in the first few minutes here. And you, I don't think how anybody on earth could be surprised about that one. Um, so that'll be enough about that one. Uh, interesting. Both these guys have 16 wins. Next fight, Garcia Nelson. Both of those guys have 16 wins. Wow, what a cool anecdote, am I right? Um, featherweight division, Kyle Nelson, Steve Garcia. Garcia favored minus 181, Nelson plus 156. Both these guys are very underrated lately. Both of them, I think, have won um, three in a row, uh, or no, um, Garcia was the favorite in his last fight before that though. He was a two to one dog before that. He was a one fifty dog before that. He was almost a three to one dog versus Chase Hooper. And he won all four of those by finish under one and a half rounds. Kyle Nelson as well being underrated a ton lately. He was, um, plus one fifty five versus Choi. He, he took that one to a draw. He was over two to one versus Padilla and versus Builder and versus Algio, and he won all three of those fights pretty convincingly as well. Pretty convincingly, um, obviously being the first guy to knock out Algio. Uh, so both these guys are underrated by the market, and I still am leaning a little bit more towards the Kyle Nelson side, just because I think Garcia's current run is just a lot more high variance than uh, Kyle Nelson's. Kyle Nelson is a fighter who really struggled with cardio in the second half of fights a few years ago, and now we're seeing him pick up like unanimous decision wins. And he is just a really interesting fighter with the way he fights behind his kicks, and he's a very you know stoic fighter in there. He 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 really maintains a, a strict stance. And he prefers kind of a slower fight, while Steve Garcia is a lot more of a wild man who who wings shots at you and isn't afraid to just kind of let loose at times. So I'm interested to see how it's going to play out. But I just think Steve Garcia is a little too reckless and a little too defensively void to be laying a uh, juice at near 65% here. I mean, he did get... Um, drop versus Nerdebeka. He did get controlled for an entire round versus Costa. He got dropped and knocked out versus Mahashate. He got even briefly hurt versus the bum Charlie Ontiveros. So you see, like a lot of his fights are just you know wild fights, and um, you know that works when you're the two to one underdog or something. But when you're near two to one favorite, I'm not really interested in it as much. Um, and I do think Kyle Nelson is a significantly better fighter than Duhu Cho or not Duhu Choi. Um, uh, Sung Woo Choi. I mixed up my choice. Uh, man, I'm sorry. Sorry, Koreans. I'm not profiling you. I just mixed up my choice there for a second. Um, and so Kyle Nelson, I believe, would be the side here. Um, I'm interested to see how this one plays out, man. I really think this is going to be a, a fun fight. Um, the under is juiced again, like it is in most Steve Garcia fights, but I think that really correlates to Garcia. So if you like Nelson in this spot, which I'm leaning towards, I think the over one and a half is an interesting angle here. And even taking that a little further, the goes the distance at four to one, maybe even a little Kyle Nelson decision at eight to one here. Um, so, I mean, Garcia has to slow down eventually. This guy's fights have been so wild lately that eventually we're going to be due for a correction, um, as Yanni the Greek would say. So, I, I, I can't wait for that one. That one's probably the, the most exciting fight on the card. Co-main event, women's flyweight division, Jessica Andrade and Natalia Silva. Andrade, or excuse me, Silva's the favorite, minus 300. Andrade, plus 250. Another Brazilian flyweight showdown, just like Lima and Dos Santos on the card in the men's division. We got another one in the in the women's flyweight division here. And a uh, good one, man. Former champ Andrade, Natalia Silva, one of the, the more uh, promising women in all of WMMA, who's been on a tear lately, um, undefeated in the UFC at 5-0. and and really hasn't faced much trouble at all. I mean, her past several fights have been kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of a walk in the park. She's been a big favorite in all of them. Um, 
But even the Jasmine fight, her debut, she was a dog in that one. She showed great takedown defense, and her striking is obviously very, very good. She's very accurate. She has great uh, lateral movement and is really good at avoiding opponents and hitting them uh, at times where they're not expecting it. And that's kind of going to be a problem for Andrade here because we know Andrade is uh, she's a, a bulldog, right? She's she's aggressive. She swings big hooks, but she's not very. Uh, she doesn't cover a lot of distance in a quick way. You can kind of predict where she's coming uh, from. So I think a woman who is, you know, has good footwork and is elusive and is good at at countering and punishing you when you're not expecting it in Natalia Silva, it does have a good style to exploit Jessica Andrade. But you know, I do I do pick Silva to win the fight, um, but. I, I can't I can't get behind minus 300 obviously it's a women's MMA fight it's likely to go to the decision there's no way that 75% is a bettable line in my opinion um, so uh, that leads me to believe that it has to be Andrade or pass but I also think that goes the distance could be good here man you know I mean we know Andrade is durable up at 125 as well um, I, she should be able to take some shots and, and, and eat them and keep coming and um, Although Andrade's durability has been been waning a little bit, right? Waning a little bit. Uh, you know, Yan Shanan did blast her with a, with a punch and knock her out last year. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I would be leaning towards the ghost of the distance here. Minus 145 for that. Um, I don't think Silva's ever going to be trying to pour it on Andrade, right? Because Andrade is going to be constantly running forward. Silva's going to be constantly eluding. I don't think Silva is ever going to be taking the front foot and putting it on Andrade. I think we're going to be trying to see a cautious approach from Silva. And that leads me to believe that we should hit the cards here and, and see a Silva decision. So GTD at uh, less than 60%, I think is the most interesting bet on the fight. And uh, I'll leave it at that. We're moving on to the main event which is a welterweight fight. Sean Brady's first UFC main event taking on Gilbert Burns in, I believe, his third UFC main event. He fought Tyron Woodley for five rounds, Usman for five rounds, and um, yes, this will be his his third five-round fight in the UFC, and uh, he's the one who's actually gone the full five before. Brady, I believe, has been scheduled for five before in CFFC, but I think he only needed four rounds, if I'm correct. Let's see. Um, yeah, he, he won the fight uh, by finish in the fourth round. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out with the cardio. I mean, Sean Brady, he, he slowed down and got pieced up by Mike Chiesa in the third round. He gassed out badly versus Bilal Muhammad in this, in the, really in the first round of that fight. Um, but got finished in the second there. And... Um, he did look good in his last fight though. Kelvin Gaslam, he did finish him in the third round, but that was just a fight. He didn't have much resistance in, you know, he, he got a takedown and a back take in the first round. Kelvin was able to reverse position, but after that, he, he hit another takedown. He was on top second round, hit another takedown on top third round, hit another takedown on top. He really faced almost no resistance from Kelvin in that fight. And that's kind of the story of Sean Brady's career. When he's able to face no resistance, he is able to win. But when he's challenged, that's when his cardio really starts falling apart and his whole his whole game falls apart. His his striking is not good. He really can't um, gain a lot of respect for opponents on the feet because uh, I just don't think that there's much behind his striking, which is a problem with a lot of the Marquez MMA fighters. They're just not very... Um, uh, advanced strikers. I mean, I'd say Joe Pfeiffer is probably the best striker of the group, but we see it with, with Sabatini, with Wells, with Petrosky, with Brady, with, uh, Ruse Boyev. These guys really are relying on getting the fight, um, against the cage or grappling or grinding on you they, they they train real hard and they they go with that grappling heavy style but when they're actually stuck at distance you see that they don't have a whole lot of depth behind their game um, Brady mostly fights behind straight punches and I just don't think that that's going to be a, a big threat to Burns on the feet so I don't think that um, Burns has much to fear about Brady here so I think on the feet it's going to be competitive I think both guys will be landing I actually kind of favor Gilbert Burns if the fight stays on the feet 
Brady, I think, will be looking to take the fight on the floor more so of the two. I think he is the better wrestler than Gilbert Burns. Uh, but Burns is no slouch. He's not going to be easily taken down here. And then when he's on bottom, I don't think he's going to be in danger of getting submitted. I think he uh, will be in danger of being controlled for a few minutes at time. But I don't think he's going to get submitted. Um, and... That leads me to believe that the best bet on this fight is to go to the distance. To go to the distance is, is at a pick em, at minus 110 on bet online right now. And I just don't see where they're getting that much finish equity for either of these guys. I mean, the no scorecard line is, a, a, again, a pick em. It's It's dead even. Um, so... I don't know, man. I just don't think these guys are as likely to finish as this line indicates. Um, I would say there's a small chance of Burns KO. But Brady submitting Burns would shock me. Um, Burns submitting Brady would surprise me. Um, Brady knocking out Burns again would shock me. Uh, and then Burns knocking out Brady. <laughs> I, hope I'm, I hope I'm not mixing up the names and I'm not, not making... I hope I'm making some sense here, but um, I really think the Burns by KO is probably the most likely finish here. But I don't rate that super highly at all. I do think he has the the, the five round the he. I mean, I know for a fact he does have the five round experience. He's gone the full five in the UFC before. He's faced a higher level competition, and I thought Burns in his last fight against Jack Della looked solid. I mean. I wouldn't say it's the best he's ever looked, but I mean, I thought he looked composed and, and he fought really well there despite eventually losing by knockout in the third round. I mean, he was really close to winning that fight by decision. And Jack is a much more dangerous opponent than Brady. So um, Burns is on a bit of a skid lately. Um, he is old now. He's 38. Um, this is probably his last go at the top of the division, but I haven't seen enough from Burns uh, to count him out here. Like I haven't seen enough bad and and um, negative things about Burns in his recent fights to think this is going to be easy for Brady. I lean Brady in for a pick um, because he's younger, six years younger, has the more career upside. I think he's a little more likely to end up on top and have the clear rounds here. But I'm not writing Burns off here, and I'll, I'll be cheering for Gilbert Burns to get the win, going against Philadelphia here. Um, really just tough to, to cheer for these Marquez MMA guys, in my opinion. They're just all so unlikable, um, and I think Burns is the cooler guy of the two. But I like Goes the Distance here. Goes the Distance is my favorite bet of the entire card. Um, I, I really enjoy that one here. I, uh, in terms of the rest of the card, not really seeing a lot of confident stuff. Um, I lean towards Nathan Fletcher money line. I, um, have some Andre Lima money line. I, I lean the under in the, uh, Santos and, and G fight, uh, Padilla sub and Padilla money line. I like that. Ash Moo's money line is the other bet I, I stamp. So the two best bets I have here are, are the goes to distance and Brady and Burns. That's the best one. Second best would be Yanal Ashmu's money line at plus money. And um, I also stamp Padilla sub and Padilla money line as well. A little on the fence about the other few I mentioned the under and the G fight, Fletcher money line, and the goes to distance in the co main event. So, um, light, light card here, light confidence card. Uh, Decent apex card by all things considered. Uh, I'm excited for a few fights here. Uh, Lima and Dos Santos sh should be fun. Ashmuz and Peak should be fun. Nelson and Garcia should be fun. The co-main and main event fights are decent matchups as well. So this card could be a lot worse. I'm looking forward to the fights after a long week off. And uh, we are back in the swing of things. Um, time for the last four months of the UFC this year. NFL starting. S college football started last week. And uh, things are things are looking up in the sports betting world. So I uh, hope you all enjoyed the podcast, got some good information. Hope you're all able to win some bets this weekend, enjoy the fights, and I'll see you all before the next UFC card next week. Peace out, everyone.